I'm gonna, I'm gonna get rolling here. Um, okay, this meeting is being record, recorded. Great. Uh, so I'm gonna get rolling here. Uh, welcome to Causal Inference in R, um, our Use R 2020 workshop. Um, we're very happy that we were able to do this still. Um, it's, it's great that they, the organizers um, did so, so, so much work uh, to get everything rolling online. Um, and uh, we were really lucky to work with um, uh, our colleagues at Our Ladies LA, which uh, I am, I'm one of the organizers over at the LAR users group. And so I was, you know, I really pushed for that because they're amazing. And so I was really happy with that. And they, they've done a really awesome job getting everything set up while Lucy and I kind of, you know, <laughs> figure out how to do this online and all that. So, um, uh, so we are, we are very, very grateful for them. So thank you, uh, um, uh, to LA, uh, our ladies for hosting us and, uh, and welcome to the workshop. We're going to get rolling here. Um, so, uh, Lucy, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Uh, so I'm Lucy D'Agostino McGowan. I am an assistant professor at Wake Forest University in North Carolina in the mathematics and statistics department. Uh, and my research is broadly, well, my training is in biostatistics, um, and I do a lot of causal inference work, in particular with um, propensity scores, propensity score weighting, and different methods uh, in that regard. And so I am really excited to be here. I, I love R, and I also love causal inference, and so this is kind of like the perfect world for me. <laughs> and I also have a podcast called Casual Inference that talks about some of the kind of causal inference techniques, but in hopefully a um, casual way uh, that sort of tries to define the terms for a lay audience. So, yeah. Highly recommended, by the way. Um, so I am Malcolm. Uh, I am a, I'm a clinical research data scientist at uh, Livongo Health, um, where I, uh, I work on um, both kind of classical uh, academic type of research and also uh, business oriented goals. And we, we use um, several causal inference techniques there. Um, my training is in epidemiology, in epidemiology, I'm an epi epidemiologist. Um, and uh, luckily in epidemiology um, does, you know, something cause something has been always been a big question. And so um, I have long since been interested in causal inference methodology from that perspective as well. Um, I, uh, I also love R <laughs> um, and uh, causal inference stuff. And so, yes, it did work out quite well uh, for this. And so um, that's why Lucy and I wanted to do this uh, for sure. So, um, so I think let's, uh, let's get rolling here. Um, so we're really gonna focus today on, um, on number three here, explain. So, I like this idea that there's really three practices of analyses. And these practices are all interrelated, but they're also distinct. You know, they're, when, we, when we're setting out a goal for each of these, we need to make sure that we're clear about those goals, right? So the main activities that we're doing in analysis are describing, predicting, and explaining. And you may do one of these more than the other in your work. You know, as an epidemiologist, uh, explaining is a big thing. Uh, but also describing and predicting are important. Uh, all three are, are important for most people, uh, but maybe your job requires that you focus on number two. You're, you're making machine learning models that do prediction and that sort of thing. Um, but you're curious about this number three, how do these tools all intersect? And so one of the things that we want you to encourage you to do is really, um, really think about when you're sitting down to do an analysis, which of these three you're trying to do and how can you use the other two to support that, that goal? Um, and so unfortunately, what happens in the scientific re uh, literature is these goals get all mucked up together. You know, somebody sits down and they are just kind of like describing their data. They're kind of like, you know, picking around, cherry picking their data. And they're like, oh, this is kind of interesting. And so they fit a, a model for it to see like, well, okay, what's associated with this and that? And like, oh, that's interesting. Now I have a prediction model. And then they write up their model and they say, well, this is just a descriptive study, but you know, maybe maybe this actually causes that. Maybe I can interpret it that way. You know? and, and so these three ideas often get really mucked up in our, in our actual day-to-day -day practice. And so uh, today we're gonna be focusing on number three, explain. And we're gonna make um, a big distinction between our usual tools um, and what those are giving us, what kind of answer those are giving us versus what, what's the actual answer that we wanna get for whether or not something causes something else. 
Um, so a big part of this is that we use regression for all of these tools, um, but a normal regression model estimates associations. Uh, regression is, it, it's, regression's amazing. It's one of the most amazing tools that we have, um, but it can't help you distinguish between cause and association. Uh, it doesn't know how, uh, and, it's, and it's not supposed to. That's not what it is supposed to do, right? So when we're doing number three, we're trying to explain, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to estimate a causal effect, not an association. And in uh, the causal inference world, one of the most useful frameworks is the counterfactual framework. And the counterfactual framework is asking uh, a much more specific scientific question than association. It's asking, <laughs> what if, what if um, you know, we're gonna talk a lot about quitting smoking today. Um, and you know, unfortunately, when I was a young man, a young foolish man, I smoked cigarettes and eventually I quit, uh, I wised up. And so, it, in this world, in this life, I quit smoking, right? And um, maybe that has had an effect on my health, right? Um, there's also a counterfactual world, a world that doesn't exist, where I didn't quit smoking, right? And if those two things, that's, if those two worlds, that's the only thing that's different, if something happens, I, I can be pretty sure that it's because of the fact that I did or did not quit smoking, right? So we're gonna be talking a lot about, about that example today, but we're gonna focus a lot on this. And so, um, you know, that's hard to measure because that world doesn't exist, right? I did quit smoking. Um, the world where I didn't quit smoking luckily doesn't exist. Um, so uh, in general, when we're actually doing this with data, we're gonna ask this question at the population level. Okay, what would happen if everybody in this study, this data set that we were doing was exposed to something versus what if everybody in the study was not exposed to it? And so the difference there, the difference in those two counterfactual worlds, that's our causal estimate, right? And uh, counter, counterfactuals, um, <laughs> there's a whole complicated literature on this. Uh, so this is a very simplified version of this. Um, I encourage you to check this out if you're interested. Um, all of this stuff has a lot of like mathematic uh, basis for this, a lot of statistical research into it. Um, so I encourage you to look into it if that's something that you're interested in. But that's really the kind of the heart of the question that we're getting at, right? And so the big difference between uh, uh, one, two, and three here is the assumptions that we need to make for them to be correct. And unfortunately for number three, we need to make a lot of assumptions that are unverifiable, right? Um, so we can do some things to, to get closer to verifying it, but there are some things that we can never know. Um, and uh, there are several of these, several important ones. Uh, Lucy will talk a little bit about this uh, later on. Uh, the one that we're going to really focus on today is the assumption that there's uh, no confounding in our study. And um, if you haven't heard this term before, the idea here is that the effect that we're seeing uh, of X on Y is only due to that relationship, X on Y, right? It's not being distorted by some other association um, that is, you know, some other variable that is associated with both X and Y, um, which can unfortunately give us this, um, classic situation where correlation does not equal causation. And we'll talk a little bit about like, wait, why not? You know, what, what, what's, what's causing that to go wrong? Why, why doesn't correlation equal causation? Um, so the tools that we're gonna be focusing on today uh, are really one and two here, causal diagrams and propensity score weighting. Um, these are tool, two tools of many. Um, a third closely related tool is propensity score matching, which will kind of touch on a little bit, but we're mostly going to be focusing on these first two tools, um, which are really, really great, really useful. Um, and uh, two of the more, these three are, are more common than some of the other tools that you'll see, uh, with the exception of maybe this first one, which is uh, something we're not really going to talk about today, but is one of our best tools for causal inference, which is a randomized trial. Um, and again, without getting into too many details, it's mostly because it, it deals with these assumptions that we need to make really, really, really well it makes it much more reasonable to make those assumptions. Um, there's also a set of methods called G methods. Um, inverse probability weighting is related to them. Um, and uh, another set of methods called instrumental, instrumental variables, um, which is, there's a set of methods related to this, like difference of difference, regression discontinuity. These are very common in um, econometrics and program evaluation and that's that type of work. Um, Whereas randomized trials, G methods, those tend to be, you see those more in um, individual level uh, health research in particular, but in other studies as well. Um, but these are all closely related. Uh, we're just picking these two because we like these two. They're very, very useful. Uh, 
these are all very, um, all very useful and they're closely related, you know, they're, they're kind of like brothers and sisters that don't get along. Like uh, <laughs> there's the, you know, one group that thinks like, oh, you know, we're the best, we do this right. But they're, they're all very, very closely related. And uh, if you kind of take a bigger picture, you see that um, they come from the same basis of causal inference that we need to do. And so we just picked these two because uh, we like these two and they're very useful. Uh, but there are these other tools as well. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to be using RStudio Cloud for these exercises. Um, this link is here. It's also in the, um, in the chat. So uh, if you haven't opened that up, I encourage you to while I'm kind of switching over to the next section. Um, and I also wanted to bring up uh, a few resources that we have available for you um, that are uh, more broader resources on, more broad resources on causal inference. Um, this is not our stuff. Um, this is more about causal inference. Um, so we're going to kind of go over quickly these, um, these elements of what, what's different about causal inference versus other uh, aspects of analyses. Uh, but there are several, several great books. These are a few that I like. Um, there's many more. Um, maybe Lucy has some additional suggestions on top of this list. I'm sure she does because we actually come from slightly different schools of thought, which is great. Um, uh, I really like the causal inference book. It's called Causal Inference. It's by Miguel Arnon and uh, Jamie Robbins. It's really good, very epidemiology oriented, so if that's interested to you, interesting to you. The Book of Why is a great introduction to causal diagrams. Um, it's uh, interesting, <laughs> and, uh, but it's meant to be very uh, uh, friendly as well. And then Mastering Metrics is one that I read recently, which is very focused on uh, econometrics methods, a very good introduction, friendly introduction to instrumental variable methods if you think that that might be of interest to to your work. Lucy, do you have any other recommendations that you like to to give out for these types of Yeah, books? that's a great question. Well, so I am, um, as Malcolm mentioned, we do come from kind of uh, different schools of training. And so for those of you not as familiar with the causal background, kind of there's, um, the, so the training that Malcolm comes from is like uses DAGs and things like this that are sort, that are what you're going to learn today. Uh, and then my training comes from the like Rosenbaum and Rubin uh, line of causal inference, which we're all doing the same thing. We just kind of use different words and stuff. Yeah. So um, I think that the recommendations that you made are great. I referenced a couple things from uh, Rosenbaum and Rubin in my slides that right. also we'll I see think those. are, yeah. But, yeah, but those recommendations are really good. Yeah. And I think that um, especially for coming at it from an introductory level, I think those are like, especially Miguel's book is one of the best out there. Yeah, yeah. And it does look at uh, different, it's not just, you know, they're very linked to this G method school of thought, but it doesn't just look at those methods, although it does emphasize them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's, that is a really great introduction. Um, and a nice thing is uh, if you use other programming languages besides R, uh, their, their website has code for a lot of the stuff in SAS and Stata and a bunch of other tools. So that's, that's really nice as well. Okay, so um, this first section, uh, I do have an exercises uh, R Markdown file for, if you open up the exercises folder in the, uh, the cloud space. Um, it doesn't actually have any exercises in it though. It's actually complete as it is, um, because in th this one is gonna be a little less interactive. Um, we're calling this uh, the, the causal modeling whole game, uh, which is a term that I, I learned from Hadley Wickham, where uh, the idea here is that we wanna show you, uh, we wanna, we want to take a, a step back for a second before we get into the nitty gritty of the code and show you like what, what are the broad strokes of what we're looking for here. So I will have code here. I'm not going to dive too much into it because we're going to talk about those um, a, a little bit later in the workshop. And I'm really going to be focusing on like, okay, what am I doing? What am I looking for? And uh, most importantly, like, where are we going? You know, uh, how, how, do I, how do we win this game, so to speak? <laughs> you know, what's the end game here? Um, and uh, so this is a little bit of a spoiler alert because you'll see a lot of the examples that we uh, will use throughout the workshop. Um, but this is to give you a bigger picture. Um, so we will dive into almost all of these examples uh, a little bit more uh, and interactively. Um, so if something doesn't quite make sense, uh, don't worry about it. Just make a little note and, um, and you'll have an opportunity to dive in a little bit later in the workshop. Okay. So the broad strokes that I'm going for here is that first I need to define my actual causal question. Um, then I'm going to draw my assumptions with causal diagrams, which is one of one of met many methods of dealing with this um, uh, these assumptions that we need to make. But it's very very useful. Um, then I need to actually model my assumptions. Uh, today we'll be doing that with propensity scores. Again, there are other ways of doing it. Um, this is what we're going to use today. Uh, we're going to do a little diagnostics. It's always good to do uh, sensitivity analyses of your um, your work, and you know make sure everything kind of a sanity check, make sure everything makes sense. 
Uh, and then finally, you know, where I'm going is I want to actually get not an association. I want to get an estimate of the causal effect that I'm interested in. Right? Often in, uh, in the epidemiology world, we end up writing papers that are like, well, you know, it's associated with this. We kind of skirt around the language. Um, but here I'm saying explicitly, I'm going to make these assumptions. And if these assumptions are correct, I'm going to estimate my causal effect. Um, and, uh, and that's very interesting. I'm not saying, you know, definitively this causes it. I'm saying if my assumptions are correct, this is an estimate of that effect, right? And that lets you uh, criticize my assumptions, which is a good thing, right? Um, so the main scientific question in this example that we're looking at is, um, do people who quit smoking gain weight? Right? We know smoking causes lung cancer, thanks to observational studies uh, using causal inference. We know lots of other health impacts of, uh, of quitting smoking. You know, we know that even if you are a smoker and you quit smoking, uh, it does reduce your risk of, of lung cancer, um, which is good news for me because uh, I did smoke when I was younger. <laughs> um, and so um, another thing that has been observed, though, is that people who quit smoking uh, tend to gain weight. Right? And so the question here is, is this causal? Is, is this actually an effect of quitting smoking um, on gaining weight? Or is something else to blame? Right? So I'm going to hone in on this, this uh, question a little bit more in a bit here, but I'm going to jump right into my data, which comes from this package CI data. Um, this, is a, this is actually an example from uh, the book Causal Inference. They use this example a lot. And um, this, is, uh, this is from the NHEF study, which is a longitudinal study. And uh, in this data set, I am, uh, so first of all, I'm getting rid of people who dropped out of the study. Um, rather amazingly, there's actually a causal inference technique to deal with that. Um, I encourage you to look into, uh, into that. Um, it's really, really cool and it's discussed in that book. Uh, but we're not gonna deal with that today. I'm just gonna remove those people for now. And this data set has, uh, has what I need in it. Um, it's two time points and uh, it has this variable Q smoke. Uh, this is the second column here that is zero if you kept smoking and one if you uh, quit smoking. So all 1,566 people here are smokers that were followed over time. And uh, we also have um, some demographic variables, some health variables, and we have uh, their weight. So we can look at this question with this data set. Um, so the first thing I want to do is, uh, is, is use number one. I want to describe, right? I want to actually know, like, what is, what is the real difference here, the real observed difference here? And even though I'm not getting a causal effect here, this is real, right? This is, this is what really happened for these people. Um, whether or not it's statistically meaningful or clinically meaningful is another question. Whether or not it's a causal effect is another question. But describing this here, what I'm seeing is, um, okay, it looks like you know, maybe zero is um, kept smoking. So it looks like maybe a few more people kept smoking. Uh, and that those people, maybe that peak there is a little bit to the left of the people who uh, did quit smoking. So this is what I was mentioning is that sometimes you observe this in this, uh, these groups where it kind of looks a little bit here like the people who quit smoking gained a little weight, a little more weight, but there's a lot of variation here. So it's really hard to tell. So if I, I dive into the numeric summaries here, um, that, that looks about right. You know, the mean is about two and a half pounds uh, heavier for people who actually quit smoking, which is one, right? So um, this is a description, right? Um, this did happen in this population. We know that uh, unless there's a significant uh, data or coding error, error here. Um, and so uh, our question that we want to get at, though, is, is this actually causal, right? Maybe there are other things that are associated with both quitting smoking and gaining weight that are distorting our effect. And so that's where drawing your assumptions becomes really, really useful. And so this is, this is the main question that I'm getting at in this analysis. Does quitting smoking affect change in weight, All right? And so this is the start of my causal diagram, which is the next section. So we'll dive into this a bit more. And uh, what I'm gonna assume is drawing from, um, uh, from this book about the confounders that they used is uh, that in fact, there are, there are other variables that are associated with both quitting smoking and change, changing, uh, a change in weight. And so some of these are demographics, some of these are uh, health variables, some of these are related to how much you smoked or how much you ate at baseline, that sort of thing. Uh, but each of these additional arrows here, uh, for instance, exercise has an arrow going from quitting smoking to changing weight uh, and to changing weight. Each of these arrows that's linked to both of these variables 
um, is something that's going to mess up my effect, right? So when, if I just do a regression of quitting smoking and changing weight, it's going to give me the wrong answer. And if this, assumption, if this diagram is correct, these assumptions are correct, it's going to give me the wrong answer. So um, why I might want to actually draw out my assumptions like this, and by the way, I, I, these are, I'm calling these assumptions, right? I'm not saying that this is correct. And in fact, I encourage you to think about whether or not this diagram actually makes sense because um, I, I think that there are probably some things that don't make sense here. Um, there's some things that maybe are not connected that should be, maybe some variables that should be there that aren't. Um, and so I encourage you to think about that um, because this is one of the best things about drawing your assumptions is that people can criticize them. And that's a good thing for, for, for you to get the right answer. So, the best thing about these types of diagrams is that it can help me answer this question. What do I actually need to account for in my analysis to get the right effect? And uh, uh, we'll dive into how, what exactly is happening here with these diagrams that, that can do it. But um, the tool that we're, we'll learn today, ggdag, and the underlying tool, Bagity, can actually answer this question. If this diagram is correct, I know exactly what variables I need to control for. Um, and in this case, it's all of them right? Because each of these is individually associated with these two. Um, and that's not always going to be the case. Um, in fact, it's very rare that it's the case that every variable in your diagram needs to be controlled for. Uh, and we'll see that a little bit with the examples in the next section. Um, but I will, uh, I will take this diagram for its word for now. Um, I think I could probably improve it, but I'll take it for its word right now. And I'll take, uh, I'll take this, uh, what we call an adjustment set for its word right now. So I'm going to include all of these variables up at the top here, um, up in the, the label up here. Uh, as what I actually need to model for. So uh, I'm, I'm going to start where I would often start, which is using a linear regression, right? Um, I have this variable weight 8271, which is uh, these participants' difference in weight um, in these years, 1971 and 1982. That's my outcome. Uh, I put my question in here, uh, quitting smoking. That's the answer that I want. And I put all these other variables in as well, right? And so this is just a normal multivariable linear regression. And this is going to give me an association, which is that uh, for quitting smoking, uh, adjusting for all these factors, it's uh, associated with about a 3.46 increase in weight uh, compared to people who didn't smoke in this population. Right? But to model my assumptions here, uh, th this isn't quite what I'm getting at. right? What I'm getting at is this counterfactual. What if everybody in the study quit smoking versus what if no one in the study quit smoking? So to model this, uh, I, I can't use this approach. I'm gonna use an approach uh, called a propensity score. And this is one of many approaches to deal with this, but um, this is a nice one. Um, so I'm actually gonna switch up my model. I'm gonna switch to a logistic regression model where my outcome is now quitting smoking, right? So before it was, um, it was my study outcome, which is weight gain. But now what I'm modeling is the probability that you quit smoking. And now all of those variables that I had had before are included in this, in this model. So this model is going to give me the probability that you quit smoking, which is uh, the basis for the propensity score that we're going to use. Uh, one subtlety is actually what we want is the probability. Lucy will talk a little bit more about this. But it's actually the probability that you, got, that you would get the treatment that you got. <laughs> <laughs> which is a subtle difference, right? So it's not the probability that you quit smoking. It's if you quit smoking, it's the probability that you quit smoking. If you didn't quit smoking, it's the probability that you didn't quit smoking. So a little bit of a subtle difference there, right? And so uh, if you know the broom package, you might recognize this function. This is augment. Uh, it's taking my model and it's running predict on the inside. It's getting my probabilities, which is called dot fitted in this, uh, in this package. And then I'm using mutate from, uh, from dplyr uh, to make an inverse probability weight. So I'm taking one and I'm dividing it by my propensity score, which is this probability of either, um, you know, if you quit smoking, it's, uh, if you didn't quit smoking, it's the probability that you didn't quit smoking and vice versa. Right? So we'll dive into this a bit more later in, later on and talk about like, okay, what is this effect? Um, are there other options that we have for modeling this and that sort of thing? Um, but this gives me a data set that now has this variable weights in it. Uh, so I'm going to take a look at this. I want to take a look at my weights. Um, one simple thing is just to look at a, at a, a density plot of my weights. And um, so, you know, there's lots of ways of looking at this. Um, I could also separate this by treatment groups, uh, whether you quit smoking or not. Uh, but I might look for extreme weights. Does somebody really, is somebody really unusual? They really seemed like they should have quit smoking and they didn't or vice versa. 
Um, and I have a few methods of dealing with that. Um, there's definitely some skew here. Um, there's some people with uh, higher weights where the mean looks like it's more around two. Um, but I actually think this is not too bad. And so um, I have some techniques for dealing with this. Um, you can truncate your weights, uh, setting the high weights to some percentile. Uh, there's an approach called stabilization that you can use that can have positive effects on your model. But I actually think, I actually think this isn't too bad. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going and kind of keep it simple for now, right? So, um, you know, if we kind of go back to our assumptions here, what I'm trying to do with this model is I'm trying to eliminate all of these arrows going into quitting smoking, right? I want to change it so that there's actually no association between all of these variables and quitting smoking. So a good way to do this is to look at the differences in those variables um, between the two groups. So between the two groups, people who quit smoking and people who didn't quit smoking, um, we can use, this is a nice measure called a standardized mean difference that Lucy will dive into later. Um, that is exactly what it is. It's a, it's a standardized way of looking at differences between groups, right? And so uh, just the observed differences here, we have uh, quite a few, quite a few differences in these different variables. So we have all these variables that we modeled on our, on our uh, y-axis, and these are the unadjusted differences. So uh, the good news is that our weighted model, when we look at these differences, uh, they're substantially reduced, right? And so this is what we're looking for. And uh, you know, in a randomized trial, ideally this is what you would see as well, uh, because uh, randomization to a treatment means that there's nothing else associated with it. So there should be no confounding by anything else, right? And so that's what we're trying to replicate here, is that experience. Um, one quick note, again, Lucy will dive into this a bit more. Um, this does not help me with things that I didn't measure that aren't in my model or that I don't know about, right? Randomization does help me with that actually. Um, but one common mistake that people make with propensity methods is they think that it, it creates exactly the conditions of a randomized trial, which it does not, right? Um, we cannot assume that these differences are eliminated from variables that we didn't include in our model that are important or things that we just didn't measure, right? So uh, we only have access to what we observed. For, for these observational models. Okay, and so finally, I can, I can go back to my linear regression model and actually model the difference in weight, uh, but now I'm gonna try and get my causal effect, that counterfactual question, did, if everybody quit smoking versus if nobody quit smoking, what's the difference in change in weight, right? So going back to my linear regression, um, I still have weight as my outcome and uh, quitting smoking as my first variable here because that's my my question of interest, uh, but you'll notice that all those other variables are gone, right? It's just these two variables in this model, the outcome and the exposure, gaining weight and quitting smoking. But I do have this new argument, excuse me, um, weights. And so this is the, this, is the, um, this set of data that we uh, just modeled with our propensity score. These are our inverse probability weights. And so these weights are going to adjust our effect such that it's answering that actual counterfactual question, right? And then we just run an regression, regression as normal and um, I can get that effect here. So uh, it's actually pretty close to what we got before. And for a simple analysis, you, you sometimes see that, um, which is uh, good news that <laughs> for, for you know, those, those analyses that are not using causal methods that should. Um, but uh, in more complex causal questions, uh, often you get quite different answers. Um, and so you have to think about, about that. Um, we do have an additional problem that we're gonna dive into a little bit here, which is that uh, because we have these weights, our standard error is now actually artificially small. So if I were to look at my p-value here in my confidence interval, they're too small, they're artificially low. Um, and so one way to deal with this is to bootstrap it. And uh, you can also fit a robust estimator and that sort of thing. Uh, but today we're gonna talk about bootstrapping because it's nice and. Uh, some recent improvements in the R uh, ecosystem have made it uh, uh, quite easy to work with this. Um, so we're gonna fix these confidence intervals with the bootstrap. And the bootstrap assumes in R, you, you're wrapping your whole analysis in a function. So it may be tempting to do this, right? We already fit our, our model, we already fit our weights, our propensity score. Um, so we'll just run our regression over and over again on some bootstrap data sets. Um, and if you don't quite know what a bootstrap data set is, we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit more detail later. Um, but this actually isn't quite right. We need to bootstrap our entire modeling process. So this is an important distinction. Our modeling process now has two steps. 
before it just had one step, which was to um, fit, the, fit the final regression model. We have to model, we have to bootstrap both of these steps, our propensity score model and our causal effect model, our inverse probability weighted model. So uh, today we're going to show you how to use our sample to bootstrap these. This is a, um, a package from the tidy models um, ecosystem. Uh, and uh, there's also a, a package called boot in R, uh, which is what I've historically used, uh, but it's got some quirks and uh, our sample is actually a pretty nice improvement over that experience for me. Um, so it's got a, a function called bootstraps and um, it, it pretty much takes care of these details for you. Um, and uh, it will, um, guide you the there's a there's a great vignette that I'll point you to or that guides you about how to actually get your um, estimates and then your confidence intervals which is pretty straightforward uh, we have this function bootstraps and then we have this function int underscore uh, something uh, I'm using int underscore t which is a t statistic based confidence interval and this will get me um, some proper confidence intervals so uh, before we, we the problem was is that we were getting artificially narrow confidence intervals that were wrong right and so the whole, <laughs> the whole issue we're trying to deal with here is that if we're using things the way we normally do, we actually get the wrong answer. And so uh, this, is the, this is one of the additional steps that we need to take to get the right answer. So um, often you'll see something like this, where you bootstrap confidence interval, or if you use a robust estimator, uh, your robust confidence interval ends up actually being wider, right? And so normally when you look at an analysis like this, you might think, oh, great, like my, my OLS, my linear regression model, it's, it's more precise. Right, but that's not the case here, unfortunately. Um, it's that it doesn't know how to account for the weights correctly. Um, and so it's artificially low because it's creating an independence, a, a dependence in the model uh, that, that the regression model doesn't know about, right? So you do need to use a bootstrap for these types of models or, or a robust estimator. Um, we don't, I don't think we have any examples of the robust estimators anymore. We just are using a bootstrap for this, uh, but uh, you've got plenty of options for that as well, right? Um, so uh, to kind of kind of wrap up this kind of <laughs> super quick uh, super quick introduction to like the whole process of what we're doing is we went for this question does smoking increase weight and we now have an actual causal effect estimate right not an association we're saying if our assumptions are correct we're estimating the causal effect right feel free to criticize those assumptions but if those assumptions are correct this is an estimate of our causal effect which is that um, a, if you quit smoking, you had about a three and a half pound gain in weight compared to if you didn't quit. Um, and so uh, this, you know, it just shows, goes to show that smoking is a complex subject. Um, it's associated with a lot of other things. Um, gaining a little bit of weight is way better than getting cancer. So I recommend <laughs> quitting smoking. It's got way, 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 way more negatives to it than positives. So, um, but this is an interesting, you know, thing about the complex nature of, of health research. And so um, I, I am going to uh, um, wrap this up, up this section uh, and uh, take a, a couple of seconds to see if we have any big questions in the chat. Um, while we do that, I want to note that, um, again, we have a very detailed version with all of the code that you need of everything that I just went through. Uh, I went through it intentionally quickly here because we're going to dive into all of these aspects throughout the workshop. Um, but if you want to review this, um, uh, later or today or now or whatever, uh, you have that option, right? If you want to come back next week and you're going to be like, wait, what do I actually need to do again to get this causal effect? Uh, this is all really like concretely laid out for you for a simple analysis, right? So it's, um, I encourage you to go and review that later. Um, so I think, um, oh, I wanted to note, um, so uh, again, causal inference is a great resource. Um, I have this resource here called Causal Inference Notebook, which has a lot of R code associated with the analyses, um, including the NHFS analyses uh, for causal inference. And then our sample has a great vignette on how to actually get uh, bootstrap confidence intervals. It's very straightforward. Um, I, I really like this improvement um, uh, in the ecosystem, which is really nice. Um, so I, I think let's, uh, let's take a moment and see if there are any big questions before we move on to a more interactive session. Anything important come up? Let's see. I need to, uh, it's a little bit hard for me to see the chat. So if somebody... Yeah, we had some questions, but I, I think I started answering them and I actually think that they're going to be better answered like as yeah. we progress. Through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think we can keep yeah. them on hold for now. Yeah. So part of this was to entice you a little bit to see like, wait yeah. a minute, what's that? What's the deal with that? 
right? And so we're gonna dive in a little bit more. Okay, great. So what I want you to do now, uh, so we're gonna go into, um, you know, that was a broad overview of the kind of aspects that we're gonna do. The rest of the workshop, we're gonna bounce between a little bit of learning and a little bit of, of, um, of interacting with, with exercises. So uh, we're gonna move on to the second section, which is causal diagrams in R. Um, so uh, this should be clearly labeled in the exercise folder. It's o 2 dash exercisesrmd or something like that. Um, so uh, at this point in the workshop, I'll give a little bit more information. I'll talk a little bit more, but then we'll actually start um, interacting with the code a little bit. Right. So uh, the subject of this session is uh, causal diagrams in R. So I already showed you very, very briefly um, a diagram. Maybe you've seen something like that, like a theoretical model that somebody might include in their research. Maybe you've actually seen a causal diagram. Uh, maybe you've seen related methods like um, structural equation, equation modeling or uh, Bayesian networks um, that have a very similar layout. Um, but you might still be wondering like, wait a minute, why, why did we do that again? Like what was, how did that actually help us in our analysis? Okay. So the big thing here is that, um, as I mentioned, we have to make some some big assumptions to actually get a causal effect. And causal diagrams, um, which are also called causal directed acyclic graphs or DAGs, um, uh, they're called directed because you'll see there's arrows in them. They're called acyclic because they don't go in circles. Uh, and the graphs. <laughs> so that's where uh, DAG comes from. Uh, I often like the simpler term causal diagram. Um, I think that's nice. Uh, but uh, we're gonna be using uh, uh, packages that use the term DAG a lot as well. So you should know that term. Uh, so the key benefit of causal diagrams is that you can explicitly lay out your causal assumptions about how these two factors that you're studying are related and how other factors are related to it. And then you can analyze those assumptions. Um, a really important thing about DAGs is that they have, while they're quite simple to use, they have this rigorous mathematical background uh, where you can by making certain assumptions, you can make a lot of progress in understanding how you actually need to model your question. And uh, sometimes we're simply, can you actually answer your question? Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you write a DAG and you go, oh crap, <laughs> I can't actually answer this question. I don't have that variable or that's impossible or, you know, some, some other issues going wrong here, right? Um, but luckily in many, many cases, it can tell you exactly what you need to do if your assumptions are correct. So the basic idea here is that you need to actually specify your question, right? So does quitting smoking at the specific time point between, um, in this case for this study, it was between 1971 and 1982, does quitting smoking at that time period uh, cause an increase in weight by the time we get to the second period, right? It's a very specific cause of question. Um, you know, you may be wondering like, okay, wait, wait a minute, where did that diagram come from? That, that's where the biggest question I get. Like, wait a minute, where did, where did this model come from, right? Um, it comes from domain knowledge, right? Um, so some of it you know, and some of it you don't know. Some of it you need to talk to your colleagues about, you need to read the literature, um, you need to iterate. Um, I have never successfully presented a diagram and everybody go, yep, that's it, you got it. <laughs> uh, it always gets um, some constructive criticism, usually it's constructive about like, wait, wait a minute, I don't know that that's quite correct, right? So usually you have to iterate your domain knowledge a little bit. And then, um, then you actually have to draw it, right? So each variable in our analysis is a, is a node. It's, a, it's um, you know, in these diagrams we'll use, it'll literally, literally be a circle with a piece of text. Um, and then we also have these causal pathways that we're making assumptions about. And each of those causal pathways is drawn as an arrow in a, in a causal diagram. So when you look at my causal diagram, you can know exactly the assumptions that I'm making. This variable is associated with that variable because there's an arrow going from, from one to the other. You know that I'm making an assumption about that. Whether or not that assumption is correct is another question, but you know that that's the assumption I'm making. So today we're gonna to use the ggdag package, which is a package uh, for using ggplot2 um, to analyze, draw and analyze DAGs. Right? Um, so, uh, briefly, I, I won't go too much into this, the design of this package, but uh, this package really connects two packages, uh, two sets of packages. Uh, one is Daggity, which is an amazing tool for analyzing diagrams. Uh, it has these great robust algorithms that work really, really well for analyzing diagrams, causal diagrams. 
Uh, and then we have ggplot2. Like this is a group of people I probably don't have to convince uh, by and large that ggplot2 can make some really, really incredible, beautiful, flexible plots. Um, and then uh, ggdag also makes use of a, another ggplot extension called ggraph, which is for making network diagrams. Right. And uh, um, if you're interested, we're not going to talk too much about this. Uh, but one, one thing that ggdag does is that it turns your DAG into data, right? And it uses this data structure called a tidy DAG uh, that you can, you can use um, in ggplot2 and ggraph, but also that you can analyze with the normal tools that you use. You know, for instance, if you use dplyr, you can apply those to this tidy DAG uh, uh, data. So step one is uh, to actually specify your DAG. And for ggdag, uh, we have this function dagify. Um, where you can write your assumptions as R formulas, right? So these are the types of formulas that you would write for LM or GLM or other types of modeling tools. So here I'm specifying a DAG where I am, I'm making two assumptions. I'm telling Dagify, I'm making two assumptions here. The first assumption is this, smoking causes cancer, right? Specifically lung cancer, but I just wrote it as cancer. Right? I'm making this assumption, smoking causes lung cancer. And uh, I feel pretty confident in that assumption. That's pretty well established. Uh, I'm making another assumption too, which is that smoking causes coffee drinking, <laughs> which maybe I'm not so certain about. We'll deal with that in a little bit, right? But the idea here is that I think that smoking is associated with coffee drinking, right? Maybe, that's, maybe being a smoker doesn't actually cause you to drink coffee, but uh, we can deal with that in a second. We can kind of clarify that, that assumption in a second here. Uh, but we'll take this for now, right? Smoking causes coffee drinking, right? And so um, this is related to a specific health question that has appeared in, in the literature many, many times, which is, is there an association between coffee and lung cancer? Um, because if you just look at the descriptive data, you will see that uh, very often there is, right? Um, however, uh, I actually have no reason to believe that that's true, right? So I'm not making that assumption here. In this diagram, I'm just assuming that smoking causes cancer and that smoking is associated with coffee, causes coffee. <laughs> um, right, so I'm making those two assumptions. And then uh, I'm gonna use this ggdag function, which is a quick plot function in ggdag to uh, actually visualize this diagram. So these are the causal assumptions that I'm making, right? Smoking is associated with both of these things, coffee and lung cancer. Coffee is not associated with lung cancer, right? If I wanted to show that DAG, it would actually look something like this, right? So now my first assumption has changed. I'm saying both smoking and coffee are associated with cancer, right? Both of these things actually cause lung cancer. And if I didn't know if that was the case or not, I really didn't know if, cause, if coffee caused lung cancer, uh, I would probably put this in like this, right? Because that's my, that's my scientific question. Here. But here I'm much more skeptical, so I'm not, I'm not actually putting that in. But if I were to draw it, it would look like this. Right? Um, so um, we still have an issue here, right? Even if, even if uh, coffee does cause lung cancer, we have this additional variable smoking that is associated with both of them. And this is a, this is a classic confounder. Right? Uh, this is a very simple example of confounding because smoking um, is associated with both of these things and it's going to distort the estimate that we actually get from trying to ask the question, does coffee cause cancer? And so it's made even worse by this situation where actually there is no effect, right? If in this case, if we do, if we do an analysis, the answer that we should get is that no, there's no association, right? Um, coffee does not cause lung cancer. Um, but because of this smoking variable, that's not the answer we're gonna get in our data if we just observe it, right? And we can't randomize people to smoking, right? That's unethical. We know smoking is dangerous. We can't put you in a trial and say, okay, you're going to smoke cigarettes for five years and you're not, right? That's unethical. We can't do that. So um, let's, uh, let's dive right into an exercise here. Um, so we've got uh, o2dagsexercises.rmd. Uh, under your turn one, what I want you to do is kind of clarify this DAG a little bit. Um, as I said, smoking causing coffee doesn't really make sense. So we're going to clarify that a little bit. Uh, and we're gonna um, we're gonna work with Dagify a little bit, and uh, then we're gonna actually draw it. Uh, and if you get done quickly, um, this might be a, a simple exercise for you if you're familiar with these types of tools. Um, there are a couple of uh, what we call stretch goals, um, and uh, those are for if you get it done a little early and you want a little bit more challenge, right? So, 
Uh, I'm going to start a timer here. These are uh, a little simple, so I set for these for three minutes. Um, but if we need a little bit more time, it's no problem. We can, we can take a little bit more time, and I'll just talk less. <laughs> Malcolm, while well, folks are working on that, um, we just had a question about the x and y axis scales. And yeah. uh, my understanding is those are actually just, they're, they're sort of random. They don't actually, yeah. but I yep. thought maybe you Yep, yep that's that. correct. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, and uh, often, um, when you uh, look at DAGs, they don't have an axis in them because those are uh, the reason that they are in the place that they are is because there are algorithms for placing those nodes in a way that's relatively readable. Um, and so, uh, so those, they actually don't have any meaning. It's, um, it's an algorithm is deciding their placement. Um, every once in a while, the, the axes do have meaning. You know, maybe the x axis is time and you organize your nodes that way. Um, but very often, there's no meaning to those. And so, um, you'll see later on that one of the stretch goals, if you get there, is to add themes to your DAG. And uh, many of the themes for DAGs just completely eliminate the x-axis because it doesn't convey any information. Yeah, it's a really good question. By the way, these countdown timers are more for us than for you. So if you need more time, it's not really, it's, it's no big deal. Um, this is more so that we give you enough time and that, you know, <laughs> we keep on time ourselves. <laughs> yeah, I always find when I don't put timers, I underestimate the time. And so I'll give like five seconds and be like, okay, is everybody done? <laughs> me too, oh. me too. Yeah, it's a problem when you already know the answer. <laughs> Yeah, so one, one important thing to note is that with DAGs, we actually aren't working directly with the data yet, right? So we're drawing our assumptions. And in these exercises, we're using the same variable names as the data set. But uh, right now, we're, we're, not, we're not yet working with this. It's a very, very common question with DAGs is um, often people ask, like, wait, how do I actually know? Like, how do I actually get my estimate now, right? And so that's not what, what a DAG is going to do for you. Right, yeah, so uh, this question about terminology, right? So um, when, I, when I say associated, um, I'm using a slightly more vague <laughs> assumption that they just have a statistical association. And we're not making any assumptions about whether or not that, that association is due to a cause, due to some kind of bias or something else, right? Um, and so that's a, that's a benefit of, of saying, I'm very, I'm very specifically interested in a causal effect rather than an association. Okay. Um, oops, I restarted the timer. Uh oh, I added more time to the timer. Oops. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run over to the uh, solution here. Um, but if we need a little bit more time for the next exercise, uh, just, throw a, you know, just throw a message in the chat and I'm, I'm happy to, to uh, pause a little bit here, right? The other place is um, in the participant window, you can say like go faster, go slower. I think you can, and that we can be monitoring that too. Yeah, yeah, happy to. Uh, it's tempting for us to go fast for many reasons and talk too much. So if you need us to do either, <laughs> uh, we love both R and causal inference. So we'll talk about this all day if we, if we are left to our own devices. Right, so, um, <clears throat> so what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm adding, um, this first assumption, which is that uh, smoking causes cancer. We talked about that a little bit. We've also added this new one, uh, addictive, right? So um, this is uh, that somebody, you know, there's something behind these two, right? There's something about a person that is their addictive behavior. This again needs more clarification for a real good DAG. But, um, 
you know, we're at least recognizing that smoking doesn't cause coffee drinking, right? There's something else that's associating the two. Yeah. Um, and then we're also adding some labels here. Uh, this is mostly for visualization purposes. Um, and, uh, and then we're actually going to visualize it, right? So we now have this extra node in our DAG. Um, but again, we're assuming that coffee does not cause cancer, right? Addictive behavior, ha being having these qualities that, are, that cause addictive behavior, whether that's like, you know, something genetic or something else, maybe we have some kind of a psychometric scale that measures this pretty well, you know, whether, you know how prone you are to addictive behavior. Um, or maybe we need to clarify this more. That's probably the case here, um, right? But we have both of these now, right? We have smoking and this addictive behavior variable, uh, whatever that actually is in our data. Um, so let's, let's look at this DAG a little bit more and, and think about uh, uh, dealing with causal effects and associations. So getting back to this question, right? An association, we're not, we're assuming, this, that's just a statistical association. We don't know anything about the causal effect element of it, right? And you hear this all the time. Correlation does not equal causation. All right, great. Everybody loves to say it. it makes people feel like, oh, I'm being, you know, I, I'm being thoughtful about this question. Correlation doesn't equal causation. But wait a minute, wh why is that, right? Why, why doesn't correlation equal causation? Why can't we just get this answer, you know? And, uh, you know, the real issue is that if we want to know this path, X, does X cause Y, right? Um, the real problem is that uh, this is only one of many pathways that are what, what we call open in a diagram, right? Um, so we have these other paths that cause associations. So if we kind of, um, swing back, oh, actually, um, let me talk about uh, this uh, function, ggdag paths. Um, so ggdag paths helps you identify the open paths that are distorting your effect estimate. If you're assuming that um, x causes y, that should be one path. If you're not, that, then, then that path doesn't exist in your diagram, right? And we'll also show you the other open paths, and those are the things that you need to deal with in your model, right? So luckily, ggdag has this uh, option, ggdag paths, that will visualize this for you. Um, and so if I go back to my, my um, smoking and weight gain diagram, remember I had a diagram that kind of looked like this that had a bunch of variables around my two questions, quitting smoking and gaining weight. Um, the real problem is here. I care about panel one, right? It's labeled, uh, labeled one up there. Those are, if you remember <laughs> from the whole game, those are, those are, that's my causal question. Does quitting smoking cause weight gain? Here's the problem. Those other nine variables are causing nine other open paths between these two. And the math behind this works out such that this is what causes the statistical association between these two variables, even if path one doesn't exist, right? If path one does exist, we still have a problem because all of these other nine pathways are gonna distort the effect that we're gonna get, right? Uh, all of these paths mix together and you don't, you actually don't know what you're getting, right? You're just getting an association at some population level and maybe you're not even getting that, right? Um, so we actually need to deal with every single one of these open pathways if we wanna get a causal effect. Uh, so we're gonna dive right in here. Uh, we're gonna look at that diagram that we just created with um, ggdag paths and also the underlying function now, which is dag paths uh, that I want you to look at. Um, so uh, we'll take a, another few minutes here. Um, you know, just let us know if you need a little bit more time or if, um, you know, you're finishing this in one minute <laughs> and you want to get onto the good stuff, you know, fit your actual model and we'll get there soon. <clears throat> this is good stuff too. Yeah, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. Yeah, this is, uh, th there was a, I have a life, a research life before DAGs and I have a research life after DAGs. You know, this really changed the game for me. We had a question before that um, I sort of briefly answered in the chat, but I thought would be worth maybe just kind of talking about while everybody's working, Malcolm. So someone was asking about um, how do you prove that what you've done in a DAG is true? And I think this yeah. is like a fundamental thing that people that are first learning DAGs think about, like what, is, yeah. what, are, we, what, what are you proving? Is it provable? And yeah. I think um, something to mention is that the whole, concept of a DAG is that you're kind of putting your assumptions down on paper and then you're assuming that those are true and then given that assumption your causal effect that you estimate if you estimate it appropriately according to your DAG is true but 
it, and, and that is all provable mathematically given that those assumptions are true. So you can't really prove a DAG. It's not possible to prove that you, for example, measured all of the important confounders. That's not a, so that's not a measurable assumption. Um, and so the DAG doesn't really serve as something that's provable. The DAG serves as your baseline, like a picture of your baseline assumptions that if that's true, then your downstream things are provably true. Right. Does that sound right, kind of right. like what? Yeah, so in practice, you have to deal with that, um, which, which usually means, um, you know, this is, as an epidemiologist, I research health questions. And so for me, often that means I go and read the literature. And I wanna understand more about what we know about this question. Uh, I talk to physicians. I want to know what's their experience. I talk to other researchers. I want to know their experience. I show people my DAG, let them criticize it, you know, and yeah. uh, iterate. So uh, we got we have to do the best we can with it because it's an unverifiable assumption. There are some statistical techniques where you can um, uh, the DAGity package has a has a tool where you can say um, where you can fit your DAG as a as a structural equation model and estimate how well it, it fits your data. Um, but that has problems too, right? That's only one way of looking at it. And it's a very limited scope in what I can help you with, right? Ultimately, it's an unverifiable assumption. It's great though, because it makes it explicit. Because I think we yes. make these unverifiable assumptions all the time in causal inference. And, Absolutely. Um, and all this is doing is giving it a very clear picture of what those unverifiable assumptions that you're making are. Right. Um, you know, if you just looked at my propensity score model, and my outcome model, you can, from that, you could glean what my unverifiable assumptions are, but this makes it much clearer to kind of anybody. Absolutely, um, yeah, happened. absolutely. And, uh, you know, what happens in, in the research is, you know, you look at a model, and you say, oh, we controlled for this, this, and that, right? And, and that's actually hard to critique, right? You can kind of think like, oh, well, maybe there's other things that are associated with the, with the two things that you're studying. Um, but it's actually really hard to critique this. And that's why people end up in a situation where they have, like, they throw the whole kitchen sink at the model. Like, anything they think might even possibly be associated, they just throw it at the model, right? And um, if you dive deeper into the world of DAGs, you'll quickly find that, actually, that's a really big problem. Right, that can that can bias your estimate just as much as not including anything. So, um, yeah. So that's a so making DAGs is a practice, um, and it's something that you can never verify. So you need to iterate with your uh, with your colleagues and let's know. Okay. So um, so I wanted to, to uh, open you up to the fact that uh, DAGs uh, in GGDAG are actually represented as data, right? So DAG paths is a function um, that GG DAG paths uh, calls this function to make a to make a uh, plot, uh, but it actually makes a, a this tidy DAG data structure that you can work with, and it, it tells you a little bit of information about it. It's telling me my scientific question, my exposure, and my outcome because we set those in exercise one, uh, and then it has this data set. This is actually what's getting plotted in the, in the GG DAG function, right? So what's different about this compared to um, compared to just a normal tidy DAG, is that now we have, uh, we have rows for each of these paths as well. Right? So in this case, actually, it's pretty simple. There's only one path, right? And you'll note that that path is not from coffee to cancer, because we are not assuming here that, that in fact, coffee causes lung cancer. Right? So there is an open path between coffee and cancer through smoking and this addictive variable. right? And so this is a confounding pathway. So when we talk about confounding, this is the issue, right? Uh, this is the issue. It's these open pathways. So this is confounding in action. All right, so the real thing that we need to do now is, okay, when we have this set up or we have this set up, uh, we need to close these paths, right? So what does that actually mean, closing a path? It means that we need to account for it in our analysis such that we're only estimating the path that we care about, right? So one of the best ways to do this is to randomize because randomization breaks all of those paths, even the ones you don't know about, which is incredible, right? Uh, the problem is that we can't randomize everything, right? Can't randomize you to smoke. That's unethical because we know it's dangerous. Uh, and some things aren't practical. You know, some things would take 20 years to do and, and it would cost, you know, just way too much money and it's just not feasible to keep people in a study that long. So some things aren't practical and some things aren't ethical. So we can't always use this tool. Uh, so the tools that we use are um, stratification, you know, filtering your data just to a subset, 
adjustment, putting something into a regression model, weighting and matching, which we'll talk about today, um, and uh, many, many other methods that we can use, right? So what we're trying to do here is we have an observed data set that those arrows aren't broken, those pathways aren't broken in our DAG, right? Um, randomization does this uh, for us, right? So we need to try and replicate that effect in our own model. And that's what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get as, we're not trying to replicate randomization, right? This is, that's often you hear that with people, they'll say, oh, well, if I match, I'm emulating a randomized trial, which is, which is not quite right, unfortunately. Um, what we're trying to do is get to the same place that randomization gets us, which is that our assumption of no confounding is, is reasonable. Right? And so in a DAG, this is called an adjustment set. Right? Uh, this is the set of variables that we need to account for. And every DAG uh, may have, um, any, any given DAG may have many adjustment sets, equally valid adjustment sets, or it may have none. Occasionally, uh, you will find in a DAG uh, that if you run ggdag adjustment set, ggdag will tell you, you, you cannot get an answer to this question with this DAG, right? There's no way to block all these paths. That does happen, right? Um, so before, when we ran uh, in the whole game, uh, we ran this, uh, this function and we got this, right? There's only, there was only one adjustment set and it was all of these variables. When I did that, it closed, when I include all those in my model, it closed all nine of these other pathways and it just left me with this one. So we're going to take a look at this uh, with our smoking DAG now. All right. So uh, we're going to try and, and uh, figure out what we need to do to close these paths. And then also I want you to write what you would need to do for a model. Like if you were writing a linear regression model or a GLM model or something like that, what formula would you have to write in R for those adjustment sets? If you assume that the variable names are the same as in the DAG. Malcolm, we had another question I thought we could address while Super. everyone's working on this. Um, yeah. Terrence asked if a backdoor and confounding is the same thing, if those mean the same thing. Right. Yes. Um, and yeah, I think like I, one definition of confounding that I've seen is that basically a confounder is a variable that can be used to block a backdoor path between an exposure and outcome. Yes, right. Right, which is a def it's a little bit of a technical definition, but I, I like it. Um, and it, it leads you to an interesting place, which is that um, one of the problems with these models in the literature that you know you just kind of throw the kitchen sink at is they're like, oh, this might be a confounder, that might be a confounder. Um, the problem is though is that there actually isn't, we'll see something interesting in this exercise, there actually isn't a confounder that is solely responsible for confounding, right? The real issue that we're trying to deal with is confounding, those, those backdoor pathways that are distorting our estimates. And um, uh, the set of confounders that you use to close those backdoor paths um, is, not off, is often not fixed. Often there's actually many ways that you can do it, many valid ways that you can do it. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, one thing I didn't really talk about here, this backdoor path is also sometimes called the, the, the backdoor criterion, which is um, a technical term I see several people in the, in the uh, audience uh, know about, um, uh, which is, um, it's, it's really the assumption of, it's directly related to this assumption of no confounding, right? 
we need to, the, if the criterion is that we need to be able to close all of these backdoor paths. Right? So uh, that's what we're dealing with here when we're dealing with these pathways. All right, so let's check this out. Let's see what we get here. So uh, ggdag adjustment set. Uh, this, uh, this wraps a, a function in Daggety that is the, an amazing little algorithm that can uh, figure out all viable, what are called minimal adjustment sets uh, um, in your DAG. Assuming your DAG's DAG is correct, which again is the difficult part. <laughs> uh, we also added labels because we thought, well, maybe this is a little bit hard to read here. Um, so maybe you got to the stretch goal for this on the last one. Um, but uh, you know, I often like to add labels here because you know it can get once you get uh, with a bunch of variables, it gets hard to read, right? So, so what is this telling us? You know, before we only had one panel and it had all of our variables in it, but now we have two panels and it's got two different variables in it. So what this is telling us is that we have one pathway that we can close in two ways. We can control for this addictive variable, or we can control for smoking. Right, and so um, one of the stretch goals for this one was to um, to examine what what if I actually can't measure this addictive variable? Then what does ggdag give me? Right, and uh, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, and uh, but, but where this leads us is um, that actually controlling for either of these blocks this pathway. Right, so you may be tempted to say like, oh, both of those are along the pathway, and I need to control for both of those. It turns out that that if your dag is correct, that that's not actually true. Right? Um, and there may be certain data situations, you know, maybe you measured smoking better than you measured this other variable or the other way around, right? Maybe you have several adjustment sets where, um, you know, you, you feel better about like, you know, this is, this is addressing some criticism that we're gonna get, right? Which is kind of a political decision about putting your research out there, but uh, that's important too, right? So if it's equally valid, right? Uh, then that's great. And so this is a different way of thinking about our models than we usually have, um, because we're saying that there are equally good ways of controlling for these pathways, right? So our model for, you know, our formula that we put in our actual model would look like this. Assuming our DAG is correct and our variables are equally good, equally well measured, these will both give us the same correct effect, right? Which should be nothing, right? We're saying that there's no coffee, there's no association between coffee and cancer, right? So if we control for either of these, it should give us the right effect, which is that there's no association, no causal effect, right, um, in this case. Okay, so that's a, that's a quick introduction to DAGs. DAGs have, can do a lot of other stuff in terms of understanding your analysis. So ggdag has several vignettes that I encourage you to check out. Uh, a deeper introduction to the package, uh, but also a deeper introduction to DAGs, and that includes a lot of resources for learning DAGs um, that I have found very, very useful. Uh, as well as an, an additional vignette that presents um, ways that uh, different types of bias can present themselves in your analysis, whether that's a research question or a data science question or, or whatever. Right? So uh, I think uh, I will uh, stop sharing here. Um, let's, uh, let's take a five minute break. I um, stole some time from Lucy. We are actually really about. short on time. I don't know uh, if I have time yeah, for a five minute okay. break. So, yeah, sorry um, about that, Lucy. That's I stole okay. some time from you. No, it's okay. I just, um, I think we got to keep rolling, but we had yeah. a couple questions about people who had could, only had one panel. So I'm going to start my slides, but maybe do you want to troubleshoot those while yeah. I'm talking? Yeah. Um, I think you can see kind of what they did in their RStudio Cloud instances, maybe. Right, 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 right. Okay. Yeah, Sorry for not giving everybody a break. Well, you'll get kind of mini breaks throughout mine too, to be able to work on code, but I just, I, we're not going to be able to finish by two if I don't get started. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's okay. No, it's great. It's good stuff. Okay. All right. So we've talked about kind of this, uh, these causal diagrams and Malcolm gave you a great uh, overview of how to, how we sort of do this whole process and that one piece in the middle for how we're able to adjust for all these different variables is propensity scores. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And I've got this brief introduction um, into some of the difference between observational studies and randomized studies that Malcolm kind of uh, alluded to a little bit at the beginning, but often the goal for observational studies is the same as uh, randomized studies, and it's just achieved in a slightly different way. So for example, in the work that Malcolm and I do, very often we're trying to answer some medical question, for example, how does some exposure or treatment affect some outcome? 
And so in a randomized controlled trial, you would have an individual that would get randomized to either be in the treatment or control group. And usually this is by something like a coin flip. So someone will have equal probability to be in either one of these groups. So uh, in this case, this coin is flipped and this person either gets the treatment, gets assigned to the treatment group, or they get the control. They get assigned to the control group with equal probability. So an observational study is slightly different because now instead of uh, these probabilities being equal between the two groups uh, due to something like a coin flip, we're dealing with uh, something different. So now in the real world, people are assigned to whatever treatment they get um, by something like their doctor. So they might go to the doctor and their doctor might look at their kind of um, all of the variables that they kind of have that describe them and may either decide to give them some treatment or not. And so we no longer have this nice setting where everybody was equally likely to get either a treatment or not. And we have to adjust for that in some way. And so here, I like to sort of, I, this is kind of taking a step back a little bit from what Malcolm was doing, but just as like a visual of what's going on here. So I've got my observational study in the orange circle. I have the people who went to the doctor uh, and were assigned, were given a treatment. And in my green circle, I've got people who went to the doctor and they did not get assigned to whatever this treatment is that my study is interested in. And all of these people have different characteristics. For example, I've got sick people, I have smokers, I have people that wear glasses, I have people with funny hair, I have people with mustaches. And each of these characters, I have Harry Potter over here, and each of these characteristics may or may not impact their likelihood of getting assigned to treatment. And those characteristics might also impact how their final outcome. So that, and that's kind of where this um, concept of confounding comes in. So for example, if uh, I like these, I had three people in my treatment group that were smokers, and I only have two people in my control group that are smokers. And so because I've got this differential effect between my treatment and control group, if smoking was an important characteristic uh, for our outcome, that's going to be something important to control for. And so this is kind of a, a, a different picture that's similar to what Malcolm was showing, but the relationship, a confounder is basically something that distorts that relationship between the exposure and outcome, for example, something like smoking. So something that is associated both with the exposure of interest and the outcome of interest. So as I mentioned, um, that, that we come from kind of different schools that do similar things in terms of causal inference, but Rosenbaum and Rubin uh, showed back in the 80s that in observational studies, if you condition on the propensity score, you can get unbiased estimates of an exposure effect uh, given that two key assumptions are true. So the first being that there are no unmeasured confounders. And so that basically means that the DAG that you draw is correct and you've measured all of the important confounders that you've indicated in your DAG. And then the second important assumption is that every subject has a non-zero probability of receiving either exposure. And so this basically just means that uh, everyone in your control group could have received the treatment, at least um, in some kind of counterfactual world, with some probability that's greater than zero. And, likely, and, and likewise, those in the treatment group could have potentially not received the treatment. Okay, so to do this, as Malcolm showed before, the, the, the easiest way to fit a propensity score is to fit a logistic regression uh, that predicts the exposure using the known covariates. So this is just the mathematical formula for a logistic regression. In R, we use the GLM function. And each individual's predicted values from that are the propensity score. So it's super easy. It's kind of a fancy word for <laughs> something that's just something that most analysts do on a regular basis, fit a logistic regression and get out the probabilities. And so in R, we can do this. I'm going to load both the tidyverse and the broom package to do this. And basically all I'm doing, I'm fitting this uh, generalized linear model the GL, using the GLM function. And what we're predicting is our exposure. And so because this is kind of like a pre-step before we do our final outcome model, uh, the thing we're trying to get at is the probability of having this exposure. So my, my Y variable here is not my final outcome. It's my exposure of interest. And then I'm going to adjust for all of the different confounders that I've identified in my DAG. And then of course I'll specify my data frame, family equals binomial because this is logistic regression. And then if I wanna actually get out those propensity scores, those predicted probabilities, I can use this augment function, which is in the broom package. And I'm gonna do type.predict equals response. And so that gets a probability instead of, uh, uh, instead of the, uh, the logit, and then I specify my data frame in order to add that value to the data frame. 
So first I'm fitting my propensity score model, and then I'm augmenting my original data frame to basically add those fitted probabilities to my data frame. So now I can use them to do things like weighting. So now each of these different individuals with all of their different characteristics have a single number summary that describes their probability of being in, of getting the exposure or being in the treatment group. And then we can use these probabilities to build weights, uh, which I'm gonna talk about in the next section. So here is a simplified DAG of what Malcolm had shown before. And so what I've done here is I've proposed a different DAG that's much simpler and likely much less true, um, but will be easier for us to work with. And so here I'm still interested in the relationship between quitting smoking and change in weight. So these center nodes here are the, still the primary uh, nodes of interest. So quitting smoking is my exposure, change in weight is my outcome. And I have four confounders here. I have sex, I have the uh, baseline weight, which is uh, in your data frame, it's gonna be weight WT71. I have age and I have years of smoking or smoke years in the data frame. And so what I want you to do is based on this DAG, I want you to uh, build a propensity score model for whether or not someone quits smoking. And so if you go into exercise uh, three in your, uh, in your um, RStudio cloud space, you can find that. So I want you to build that model. And then as a stretch goal, I'm giving you five minutes to do this. Uh, and so as a stretch, if, if that was super simple to just fill in those pieces, I want you to try to create two histograms, one for the propensity scores for those that quit smoking and one for those that did not. So you can kind of compare what those propensity score distributions look like. And then we'll talk about it. So I just thought um, while you're working on that, I see a, a, one person asked um, the difference between propensity scores and propensity score weighting. And um, I think maybe Malcolm answered this a little bit in the chat, but I thought I just mentioned, so basically propensity- I accidentally sent my message to the wrong place. Yikes. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so a propensity score is, is always gonna be the probability of uh, getting the exposure or getting the treatment, whatever that thing is that you model. So that's gonna, that's fixed, that's gonna just be that. And then there are all different ways that you can incorporate that propensity score into your final outcome model in order to get at this causal effect. And so weighting is one way to do that. Um, and we're gonna, in the next section, talk about a couple of different ways that you, can, that you can weight that will sort of have a different impact on the causal estimate that you're getting at. Uh, but matching is also a way that you can incorporate the propensity score. You can do a direct adjustment actually of the propensity score um, there, there are several different ways that you can, you can use the G formula that uh, Malcolm had mentioned before. So there's a lot of different ways that you can incorporate those propensity scores into your final model. So the propensity score weight uses the propensity score. It's a function of the propensity score. Um, and the propensity score is just kind of its own thing, constant thing. Yeah, that's great. Um, so uh, one, one other message that I responded to, um, that I sent to the wrong place on accident because <laughs> Zoom's chat's not the best, um, uh, was uh, in response to the people in the last exercise for GGDAG uh, that got uh, different panels than I showed. Um, the reason that you got different panels is likely that you did the stretch goal. You, did, you uh, set things as latent in your DAG. And so um, GGDAG and Daggity have a way of saying, I, I, I don't actually have this variable. You know, I can't measure it or I didn't measure it or whatever. And Daggity and GGDAG are smart enough to know that I'm not gonna give you an adjustment set that includes that variable because you can't do it, right? So if an adjustment set requires that variable, uh, it's not a valid adjustment set because you can't actually incorporate it, right? So if you marked addictive as latent, you'll only get one, one adjustment set, smoking. If you marked them both as latent, it will tell you, you know, yikes, uh, bad news, buddy. Um, you actually can't get your causal effect because you can't block this pathway. So 
you have to redo your study <laughs> and measure these things next time. Yeah, right. No, that's not a, so that's not a typo. That's an explicit declaration of what variables you have and what you don't. And that's very useful because you may know that something actually is important that you don't have measured. Right. And so people might criticize you for that, but you can say, look, if I make these assumptions about my DAC, um, even though I haven't measured this variable, there actually is a valid adjustment set that will give me my causal effect. Right. So that can, that could be very useful. All right, so we've got about one more minute. Um, and so while we're kind of, um, you're wrapping up, I'm gonna start running some of this code here so you can see um, what, what you should be getting. So first thing I'm gonna do is just run all those packages, tidyverse, broom, CI data, and ggdag. And here I'm using the NHEFS uh, underscore complete data. I didn't remove the censored individuals in this particular analysis, although you certainly can if you'd like to. Um, but just for example purposes, we're just sort of using the whole data set here. And so I'm going to run this just so we can see that DAG again to remind ourselves of what confounders I've proposed as important in this, uh, in this model. And so I've got, um, let's see. We've got, oh, they disappeared. We've got uh, smoke years, sex, weight, baseline weight, and age. So I'm going to want to make sure I include those. So in my propensity score model, this, I'm going to use the GLM function to fit that. And my outcome here for, the, for this model, because this is the propensity score model, my outcome is my uh, exposure, which is the quit smoking, so QSMK. And then my confounders, as per my DAG here, are sex, age, smoke years, and baseline weight, so that weight 71. So I'm going to fill those in. My data is this NHEFS underscore complete. And then my family is going to be binomial because I am doing a logistic regression here. So I'm going to run this so I get my propensity score model. So now that propensity underscore model is going to be my model object. And I'm going to change this eval to true here. So if I knit my whole thing, it'll, it'll evaluate that. And then I, now I'd like to actually add those propensity scores to my data frame so that I can use them later. And so to do that, I'm going to use the augment function, which is from the broom package. And I'd like to do the type equals response. And so what that does is that makes sure that I'm going to actually get a, a probability instead of a logit. And now my data is going to be this NHEFS complete because that is the original data set that I'd like to add this to. So I'm taking my propensity score model and I'm augmenting to get that, uh, that fitted value, the propensity score. And what I'm doing is I'm adding it to the NHEFS underscore complete data and I'm calling this new data set DF. So now down in my console, I can run that to see what it looks like. And I get my full data set, but I notice if I, if I saw this dot, dot, dot down here, I would have this variable fitted, this dot fitted, which is my actual propensity score. Okay, so now for the stretch goal. So there's several ways to do this. And in fact, I'm gonna show you a slightly different way in the, next, um, in the next set of slides, but I can fit these histograms by taking that data frame that includes the propensity score. And I wanna plot that dot fitted variable. And I wanna plot it separately for my two groups, for my uh, smoking and non-smoking, or quit smoking and non-quit smoking groups. So my group is gonna be this QSMK. And I'm going to change the fill so that um, you can see a different color for each of these. And then I'm going to do geome histogram. And so this is going to give me uh, overlaid histograms of my smoking propensity scores and my non-smoking propensity scores. And so what I see from, I can see a couple things from just looking at this immediately. The first thing I see is that I have a uh, far more people that did not quit smoking than did. So this blue are, are my people who quit smoking and the red are people who did not. And then I can also just look at this distribution. I can see that the people who quit smoking end up having propensity scores kind of higher up here in the tails. 
And the people who did not kind of have, tend to have more propensity scores kind of down here compared to those who did. And that of course makes sense because the propensity score is gonna be the probability that you quit smoking. And so you'd expect that people who did quit smoking probably had a higher probability of quitting smoking. And you would also expect the people who didn't quit smoking might have a lower probability of, of quitting smoking compared to those that, that did. So this just gives us a little bit of insight into that. We're gonna delve into this type of plot a lot more right now, actually. So let me do that. Oh yeah, so uh, the data set comes from this library CI data, exactly. Um, and it should be loaded already in your, uh, in your RStudio Cloud session, so you shouldn't have to download it. But if you are working in your own R session, like on your personal computer, you actually can get it from Malcolm's GitHub. So, um, all right, let's go back to the slides. All right, and then I'm gonna switch to the next set. Okay, so now we are gonna talk about propensity score weighting. All right, so as we've sort of mentioned a couple times, there are a lot of ways to include propensity scores in your final model. Um, some common ones are weighting, matching, stratification, direct adjustment. And so today we're gonna to focus specifically on weighting. And so there's all different types of weights that you can use. Uh, to be able to estimate different target estimates. And so this is something that I think uh, is not always super well understood in the causal inference framework, but I think it's really, really important. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on it because the target estimate that you're trying to get at actually makes a huge difference and it totally changes how you do your analysis. Um, and so the most common target estimate and the one that Malcolm was talking about when, when he was doing his uh, was doing his slides earlier, is the average treatment effect. And so the average treatment effect, the reason why this is the most common is likely because this is what is estimated typically in randomized trials. And so um, in this case, your target population is the whole population. So both your treated and your control group. And of note, um, this is often declared the population of interest, but actually it's not always the most medically or scientifically relevant, kind of depending on your underlying question. And so you do wanna be kind of conscientious about what the thing you're estimating, how that applies um, broadly. So the average treatment effect assumes that every participant can be switched uh, to the opposite treatment. So that basically everybody in the control with some, control group with some probability could have been in the treatment group. And similarly, everyone in the treatment group could have been in the control group and basically that you can make these switches, um, which kind of isn't always exactly how you would make that particular assumption. And so it's estimating this average effect across your whole population. And so when you're doing that, this is the mathematical equation to estimate those weights. This is the same as when Malcolm talked about inverse probability weights, that's exactly what this is estimating. It's written in a slightly different way, um, just so that it sort of mathematically is easy to translate between all the different weight types of weights that I'm about to show you. But uh, if you look at this, the ZI here is whether or not you're in, the, is whether in the treatment group. So ZI is one for people in the treatment group and it's zero for people in the control group. And PI is your propensity score. And so if we just take a second looking at this equation, among people who are in the treatment group, their weight is gonna be one over the propensity score. So, cause Z will be one, so it'll be one over the propensity score plus one minus one, which is zero over one minus the propensity score. So this part drops out. So among those in the treatment group, it's just one over the propensity score. Among those in the control group where ZI is zero, this first part drops out because ZI is zero, so this part drops out and you end up with one minus zero, so one over one minus the propensity score. So this ends up being exactly what Malcolm showed you before where it's one over your probability of getting the treatment that you got. So among the treated people, it's one over the probability of getting the treatment. Among the control group, it's one over the probability of getting the control. So that's the weight that, that's, this is the most common weight. When people talk about inverse probability weighting, this is usually what they're referring to. But it's important to note that there is a specific causal estimate that this is estimating. It's estimating that average treatment effect across the entire population. Another really common uh, one that is used is the average treatment effect among the treated. 
And so now our, our causal, our estimate of interest, our population of interest are the people who got the treatment. And so this ends up being slightly different and it gives you a slightly different weight. So now you end up with, um, the people in the treatment group end up just getting a weight of one. And the people in the control group end up getting uh, a weight of uh, the propensity score over one minus the propensity score. And so, uh, and Malcolm mentioned a little bit about stabilizing. This is like one way that sometimes can help stabilize your weights a little bit, depending on your distribution uh, of, of propensity scores. Um, and so, for example, if you have lots and lots and lots of people in either your treatment or control group, you might want to consider kind of some of these other causal estimates that might be easier to estimate. Uh, similarly, you can actually estimate the target population could be the control group. So you might want to know how would the control group be if they had all switched over to the treatment or vice versa. And so the average treatment effect among the controls is similar, um, except now uh, among the controls, they're going to have a weight of one and you're going to basically be weighting all of the treatment group to look like the control group. The next is the average treatment effect among the evenly matchable. And so this one's a little bit more complex, but basically what this does is it it weights your population in a way that's very, very similar to if you did a matching, like a propensity score matching. And so this actually has some very nice properties because uh, in particular, it doesn't have the possibility to uh, blow up in the tails. And so if you can imagine all of these weights because they have the propensity score or one minus the propensity score in the denominator, if those values are very, very, very small, you can end up with basically infinite weights. Um, and so then you can have like one or two individuals that end up having a lot of pull in your final outcome model. And as Malcolm mentioned, there's things you can do like trimming um, and things like that. But, but one thing that I sometimes like when, when I'm in a situation that I have something like that is to actually be intentional with my causal estimate. And so if the population I have really can't estimate um, things well in the tails, then maybe I need to change the causal estimate that I'm, that I'm going for. And the ATM is a nice way to do that. And then finally, the average treatment effect among the overlap population. This has this very elegant weight. This is a newer, um, these overlap weights are kind of a newer formulation in the past couple of years. And they're very similar to the, these matching weights, um, but they just have some improved variance properties. And so basically, the overlap population are people who were kind of in the middle. They were pretty likely to have gotten either the treatment or the control, and you're kind of estimating how, how they would do. So that was kind of abstracted and a little bit mathematical. And so I'm gonna show you what this looks like graphically and hopefully that can help kind of drive it home. And then I'm gonna let you all estimate these weights in R. So I've redrawn this uh, histogram of propensity scores that we just created, except instead of overlapping them, I've made them mirrored such that on the top here, this is my histogram of the propensity scores for the treated uh, population. So this is for people that quit smoking and on the bottom here, it's my control group. So these are people who did not quit smoking. And I like this mirror because it makes it much easier for me to compare directly that like, yes, I have more mass over here in my control group on the side of having low propensity scores, which as we mentioned, makes sense because the propensity score is your probability of getting treatment. And people that didn't get treatment probably were less likely to. And I also can look that over here, I have a little bit more mass, a little bit of a longer tail for my folks over here, which for the people who did quit smoking. Um, so it looks like there were a couple people who quit smoking who also based on their characteristics in my model were very likely to have quit smoking. And so now what I've done is I've created these pseudo populations that are based on the weights that I've used. And so these are using ATE weights. And so you can see in the colored part, uh, underneath I still have the histogram of the original propensity scores. And you can see how those were upweighted or downweighted in different ways to be able to sort of get them to um, represent a, a different pseudo population. So the ATE, the whole point of this average treatment effect is that basically I want to be able to compare two comparable populations. And so I want my treatment and my control group to pretty much look the same. And so what's being done here is that both the treatment and the control folks are getting upweighted such that basically these distributions look very, very similar. And so that's how the ATE works. The ATT, that's the average treatment effect among the treated. It treats the, all of the treated folks as just they get to stay themselves. So that distribution for the treated folks looks exactly like it started. Um, but then it, it downweights or upweights. So it basically changes the control population to basically mirror that. So we've taken, this is the full control population in gray, and the blue is the weighted population. And so some people are downweighted, people who have characteristics like over here that are kind of less likely to look like my treated population, they get downweighted. 
And then people over here end up getting a little bit upweighted. And so this kind of basically makes the control population look like the treatment population. And I can estimate the difference between these two populations in my outcome. And it'll give me this average treatment effect among the treated. Similarly, I can do the same thing with my average treatment effect among the controls. And so here, my population in the controls is exactly what I observed in the, in the real data. But now I've weighted my treatment population to look more like this control group. And so now when I take the difference between these two weighted populations, I'm going to get an, an average treatment effect among the controls. So if my treated people all looked like the controlled people, what would that average treatment effect look like? So kind of thinking in that counterfactual framework that Malcolm mentioned, what I'm doing here is essentially I'm building counterfactuals. And so in the very first one, we're building counterfactuals where we're sort of taking this, uh, we're taking both the treatment and the control group and we're shifting them slightly so we end up with this like average effect across both. In this case, my counterfactual, I'm taking the treated group and I'm building a counterfactual for each of those treated uh, participants from my control group. And in this case, I'm taking my control group and I'm building counterfactuals for my treatment group. The ATM, so now this ends up in this particular population looking very similar to the ATT, and that's because we have far fewer treatment than versus control folks, and so you can very easily have a good match for each of them. So if we were doing a matched analysis, this is kind of similar to what you would see there. You, you would probably take almost all of your treated folks and you'd match them to a subset of your control group. And the ATO you see is just slightly attenuated. So um, it's similar, the distribution looks quite similar to the ATM, but it's a little bit attenuated, which, which is what gives it a little bit better variance properties. Um, but again, these ATO and ATM are never gonna be upweighting, they're always downweighting. And so you never end up with the, um, the problem of having these exploding weights that you would have to adjust in some way. Okay, so how do we do this in R? So here's our, uh, our formula for the ATE. So all you're going to do is, after you've augmented to get that propensity score into your final data frame, we're just going to do a mutate and we're going to stick this formula directly into our mutate function. So I'm calling this weight W underscore ATE, and I just take the indicator that, they're, that you're in the treatment group, so that's the QSMK in the case of quit smoking, and I divide by the fitted, which is my propensity score, so that's just the Z over PI, and then I add 1 minus D, so 1 minus QSMK, divided by one minus the propensity score. So now it's your turn. I want you to go ahead and use the propensity scores that you created in the previous exercise to add the ATE weights to your data frame. And then if that seems way too easy, uh, I want you to try to add a different type of weight. For example, you could try to add the ATT weight or the ATO weight or the ATM weight uh, or something like that. I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to do that and then we'll regather and I will show you how to do it. Just based on time, I'm actually going to give three minutes for this instead of five minutes. So we cut a little bit short, but I am happy to stick around for a couple minutes after uh, the end of our session. I just want to make sure we're respectful of everyone's time. Um, so uh, if, if people have further questions, I'm happy to stick around. Yeah, me too, especially since it's really, it's really my fault. I take responsibility. No, no, it's not your fault. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot to talk about. Yeah. Maybe we shouldn't. We did. We were originally had a three-hour workshop for the uh, use our live version. We decided, oh, you know, maybe two hours is better for online. Yeah. Stuff, you know, the stuff's too interesting to us. <laughs> it's true. It's too exciting. Oh uh, no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Sorry. If sorry. If, if that made it sound like it was like we took the same content and squeezed it into two hours, that's not quite right. We we actually did. Uh, you deleted a couple. A lot of stuff. We, yeah, we removed a few things just to simplify. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if that's you know I, if that um, leaves you itching for more, please do let us know um, because you know we may offer this again in the future, and we'd like to, we'd love that feedback uh, from you all. Someone Four asked him. <laughs> Oh, someone asked in practice um, if I normally report the ATE or lean towards the ATM and ATO. So I personally, um, it depends on like the clinical question of interest. I have used the ATE, I've also used the ATT, and I've also used the ATM in papers that I've done. I have not yet published a paper besides like a theory paper that used the ATO, and that's only because uh, it's, it's relatively new and so people are still getting on board with it, but I have several 
theoretical papers that have used it. And I think it, it should get traction in, in the future. Do you use any of these, Malcolm? I actually have found that this is not something that that many people think about too much, so. No, I, I often use, uh, I, I pretty much use the basics, uh, AT mostly yeah. and uh, occasionally ATT um, as, as needed. But uh, yeah, AT is my, my bread and butter Go for to. sure. Cause that's usually, yeah. that's actually usually the effect that I want, right? That so, you're interested in. Right, yeah, exactly, scary. exactly. Um, yeah, but these other ones are so interesting, especially their connection to, to matching. So the next question was about my favorite matching algorithms using the ATM. So the interesting thing is when you use the ATM, you don't do any matching. It's, it's just a weight. So you take the propensity score and you weight it um, using this formula here. So I, you, you literally plug in the minimum of the propensity score over one minus, minus the propensity score divided by Z times the propensity score plus one minus Z times one minus the propensity score. You don't have to do any weighting. But if you're comparing it to a matching algorithm, um, a lot of times people do like exact mass matches or they'll do a caliper match or, um, or something like that. But there are a lot of different ways to, to do matching. It's like inherent propensity. It, it, it is like a propensity score. It ends up getting, the effect ends up being very similar to what you would get for a propensity score matched analysis. Yeah. Okay, I am going to share my screen and do run through this real quick. So, okay. So the, the AT, so I've taken my, this data frame that we uh, created where we augmented it to add those fitted values. And so the ATE ends up being QSMK divided by the propensity score plus one minus the exposure divided by one minus the propensity score. I'm just gonna add that. And then of course the ATT or any of the others will just be using the formulas from the, from the, um, from the previous slides. Here, this is how I created those plots in case this is something that anybody is interested in doing. And so the only thing you have to change here is the weight that you wanna look at. And so, um, just run this real quick. Oh, Make sure you change all those evals to true so that you can see them. And And this, I think, is kind of that nice, it shows you that distribution um, of those weights, which I think is a nice way to sort of visualize it. I like to do this definitely if I'm using the ATE, ATT, or ATC, because it can let me very quickly see if I have any weights that are really kind of blowing up that are going to end up affecting like my estimates or my standard errors or things like that. All right, go back to the slides. Okay, so now we're going to talk about diagnostics, and this is like one of the most important parts. So it's pretty easy to fit the propensity score model, and it's pretty easy to create the weights. But then once you've done that, you want to make sure that you've kind of gotten good balance. And so this is where there's kind of an iterative process involved. So you've proposed a DAG that you think kind of is the correct DAG, um, and then you fit your propensity score model. And then after you fit that propensity score model, you want to check to make sure you actually have good balance between your exposure uh, but between your two exposed and unexposed group across these different um, covariates, the confounders. And if you don't, then you might want to kind of update your propensity score model accordingly. And so there's two ways that I like to check these. One is something called a love plot. It's called that because someone named Thomas Love uh, came up with this idea. Some, most people, other people might call it just a standardized mean difference plot. Um, but I, I like the term love plot. I think that's very nice. And the other is an eCDF or an empirical CDF plot. And so I like my love plot is basically just a one big nice summary across all of my potential confounders in my model. And it, it, it's uh, one that Malcolm showed in his uh, big picture overview. And then the ECDF plots, those are really nice for your uh, continuous uh, confounders that you're, that you're estimating. And basically what it does is instead of just looking at a single summary measure, you can look at the entire distribution of that confounder and make sure that you end up achieving balance after you do your propensity score weighting. So the standardized mean difference is a very uh, simple formula. It's just 
the average um, of your, whatever your confounder is in your treatment group minus the average of that confounder in your control group divided by the square root of their pooled standard deviations. And so um, this is a very common metric that's used to sort of do some post uh, balance analysis for propensity scores. There's kind of a rule of thumb that you try to get this to be less than 0.1 for a lot of your, um, for, for your confounders, although that um, is, it's not definitive, but it's kind of a nice way, sort of that you don't want it to, your standard mean difference to be more than 10%. So how do we do this? Okay, so there are several steps here, and some of this is like not totally intuitive. So the very, this very first step I think is not super intuitive and has a little bit to do with the fact that the R ecosystem is just not quite up to date on, um, how best practices for propensity score weighting. And so we're sort of make use of patching together a lot of different tools that get us at the right answer, but they're not intuitive. And so one of them is that for propensity score weighting, a very common package that is used is the survey package. Um, and so this is, uh, I think Thomas Lemley made this package and it, it is for survey weighting, although you, with the way that surveys are weighted is actually, the same as how we would be waiting for a propensity score model. So the package name itself is not totally intuitive, but the, what we use it for is exactly what you would need. Um, Malcolm and I have talked a bit about trying to create some tools that maybe have a little more of intuitive design behind them, but for now we're gonna kind of work with this. So the first step for creating these love plots is to create a design object that incorporates the weights. So this is sort of like, a, it's not a data set, it's a design object, but it's kind of like creating an object that contains all the information about your initial data set and the weights that you're incorporating. And so to do that, you load the survey package and then you run this survey design function. IDs is just gonna be equal to a tilde with a one. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, data is gonna be your original data frame. And then weights is gonna be a tilde with the name of the variable in your data frame that has weights. So I put uh, WTS here in the example that we just did, I would have put W underscore ATE since that was the name of the weight that I created. So this creates this design object survey underscore design. That's step one. Step two is calculating the unweighted standardized mean differences. And so this gives us kind of like a baseline to compare to. So this will tell us kind of what the differences were between each of these confounders between the exposed and unexposed group before we did any weighting. And so for that, I like to use the table one package. And so I'm going to load that table one package and the main function is create table one. And then I'm gonna set the variables. And so the, this vars parameter is gonna just contain uh, strings to, to name each of the confounders that you included in your original model. Whoops, sorry. And then the strata here is gonna be exposure. And so in, if, uh, if, we were doing this with the quit smoking data, I would put the QSMK in quotation marks here. And so that just dictates what I'd like to split these standardized mean differences by. And then the data is gonna be your data frame. And then I'm gonna set test equals false because this is kind of important. A lot of people try to do like hypothesis testing uh, on these to try to show that the standardized mean differences are kind of significantly different. And that's actually really not appropriate in this setting. We really don't want to be doing hypothesis testing. We're not trying to get p-values. We're just trying to check the balance. And so this is kind of a, an important distinction there. Okay, so that's for the unweighted table. And then I want to make a weighted table to look at the weighted standardized mean differences. And so this is going to let me look at my balance post propensity score weighting to see and kind of how well the propensity score did at balancing all these different confounders. And so for that, I use the very intuitive function survey, SBY, create table one. And so again, this is not totally intuitive because a lot of this was built for survey methodology, which is not exactly what we're doing, but it works the same as what we're doing. So just kind of bear with me with some of that terminology. So survey, create table one. And then the next two are exactly the same as my unweighted version. I'm gonna just list all of my confounders as my variables. I'm gonna list what my exposure variable is for my strata. But now instead of using my data frame, for data, I'm gonna put in that survey design object. And so that's basically this object that includes both all the information about my data frame and the weights that I'm incorporating. And again, I'm gonna do the test equals false because I'm really not interested in, in doing any kind of hypothesis testing. I'm just trying to get kind of a visual uh, descriptive measures of my, of my um, standardized mean differences. So that's step three. So step one, we create the design object. Step two, we create the unweighted table. Step three, we create the weighted table. 
And so the two, the big thing that's different between step two and three is that we're using the survey create table one and we're using the survey design object instead of the original data frame. Okay, step four. So now we're sticking this into a data frame. And the reason this looks a little bit gnarly, but what I'm basically doing is I'm trying to create a nice data frame that I can then feed into my ggplot to be able to make that nice love plot. So the first, uh, the first variable in this data frame, I'm calling it var, and it's gonna be the row names of extract SMD of my SMD table. And so if I ran this just like in the console, I would just get like confounder one, confounder two, I'd, just get, I'd get a vector of all of the variables that were included in my standardized mean differences table. And then my second, my second variable is called unadjusted. And for this, I'm basically pulling out, so I'm using the as numeric to just get the numeric values. And then extract SMD, that's pulling out the standardized mean difference from this SMD table unweighted. So this is pulling out those unweighted standardized mean differences from this object that I created before. So if I ran just this in the console, I would get just those numbers, a vector, a numeric vector of all of the standardized mean differences for my unweighted table. And then weighted is gonna do the exact same thing except for my weighted table. Hopefully these standardized mean differences are smaller because we're hoping that the weighted uh, analysis gets those two distributions to look closer. And then this final part, pivot longer, I'm basically just pivoting that data frame so it is nice and workable with ggplot2. Um, and so don't worry too much about this code, I provide it for you in the example and you can just copy and paste it. Okay, so step four is actually plotting this in a love plot in ggplot. And so my data is gonna be that plot underscore df that I just constructed. And then I'm going to have the variable on the x-axis, the standardized mean difference on the y-axis. And then I wanna group by method and my color is gonna be method. And so basically what that's doing is it's gonna create two separate lines, one for the unadjusted and one for the weighted model. And then I wanna add a line for each of those. I wanna have a point. I'm adding this at h line, this horizontal line at point one. And that's because that's kind of that rule of thumb. And so we're kind of hoping to give it a quick eyeball and make sure that the weighted, uh, the, the weighted version is sort of shifted beyond that point one point. And then I'm gonna actually flip the coordinates so that the x-axis is the y-axis and the y-axis is the x-axis because I think it's easier to look at that way. Okay, so here's what this ends up looking like. And so in the red, we have the unadjusted model. And so this is before we did any adjustment. And you can see that the standardized mean difference across these different variables is pretty different between my two groups, in particular age. So age is quite different between the people who quit smoking and those who did not. But in the blue, I see my weighted analysis and it's nicely all below my 0.1 rule of thumb and basically much closer to zero. And so my differences between these groups is much, much smaller. So this is a nice way to kind of visualize that. So you wanna do something like this to be able to get kind of an idea for balance. So what, I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to do that. We only have three minutes <laughs> left, but actually I'm not gonna give you a couple minutes to do that. I'm gonna move on and then we'll let you all try some of this at the very end if you still want to. Yeah, maybe we can jump to, um, jump to the outcome model. Yeah. At this point. Um, yeah. yeah. And of course, if you need to go, uh, we of course totally understand. Um, yeah. We'll hang out after and ask questions. Uh, but if you do need to go, remember these materials are all here. You know, the, their exercises are guided, so um, you know you can uh, you can work through these last uh, two or three. I think there's two or three more total. Um, yeah. Uh, on your own, feel free to email us, uh, ask questions, post them on the uh, meetup uh, comment board, that kind of thing. We, we're happy yeah, to help. Or tweet at us. We're happy to answer. Or tweet at us, and yeah, I'm actually taking a Twitter Twitter break right now. But, oh, okay. So you, you, could, can tweet you can tweet at, at Lucy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so briefly, the ECDF is basically just looking at the whole distribution instead of just a summary measure like the mean. Uh, and so that this is kind of a nice way to look at um, pre and post weighting as well for your. So this is some code here, which we've got you got available in your slide deck, so you can look at that. Okay, let's jump to the final outcome model, just so you can put it all together. This is actually a very short slide deck because most of the heavy lifting is done before this. So fitting the outcome model. So once we have the weights, the outcome model is actually quite simple. All you're going to do is just regress your outcome on your exposure if you have if you're outcome is linear. So in this case, um, our outcome was change in weight, which is a continuous variable. You can just use a basic linear model, LM. 
uh, you set your data and then you set your weights here. And you can use uh, tidy to be able to pull those out in a nice way. Now, this is gonna give you the correct point estimate, so that's great, but this is not gonna get you the correct confidence interval. And so this is where uh, the R sample package comes in. Uh, and so that's what Malcolm was mentioning at the beginning with bootstrapping. And so to do that, you're gonna create a function to run your entire analysis on basically a sample of your data. And so this function, it's just, we, we're gonna have one argument for this function split. And what that is, it's because the R sample uh, has a way to basically split your analysis, split your data frame into um, like a small, like a subset of it, or maybe even just a sample from it. So it could be exactly the same size as your data frame, but you've resampled some of your uh, observations multiple times. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna get my, I'm gonna take my, uh, I'm gonna take my, my data frame, I'm gonna split it, and then, this code here is all exactly what we've already done. So here, I've, this is my exact same model, my propensity score model that I originally did. So if I was doing this with the Q-smoke data, I would replace this word exposure with Q-smoke, and then I would have tilde, and I'd have age, sex, whatever I was putting into that model. And then the family's gonna be binomial, my data is gonna be .df because that's what I set my data frame as up here. And then this next part of code is gonna be also exactly the same as the code we've done before. I'm gonna augment my uh, .df data um, with my propensity score and I'm gonna add my weights exactly as I did before. So this is just copying that same exact code. And then my outcome model is gonna be that exact code that I just showed you on the previous slide. It's just gonna be my exposure tilde outcome. The data is gonna be .df. It's that, this data frame that we've augmented here. And my weights are gonna be my weights that I've calculated. And then I'm gonna use the tidy function from the broom package to kind of tidy it up and pull out the right estimate. Okay, so this is the function that we're gonna create. And how do we actually bootstrap this? Well, there's a function called bootstraps. And you can plug in the uh, data frame, your original data frame into this bootstraps function. You can say how many samples you'd like. So in this case, I'm gonna do a thousand. And then I'm going to map the splits from these bootstraps into this fit underscore IPW function. So that fit underscore IPW function is this whole function that runs my entire analysis. And so what I'm doing is I'm effectively running this analysis a thousand times. And then I'm gonna take those results. And so I've saved this as IPW underscore results. So I'm taking those results and I'm using the INT underscore T because I wanna get a T statistic based confidence interval. And I'm going to pipe that and just pull out my exposure term. Okay, so in this final, um, we have, oh, we're only two minutes over, that's not too bad. So in this final one, basically, this just kind of walks you through that exact same uh, process, but um, plugging in the pieces that you have already done so far. And so what I think we're gonna do now is you can, let's take a couple minutes for folks to ask questions. And then if you wanna work on these different um, examples from, uh, from five and six on your own and uh, give a, send us any questions that you might have, we'd be happy to sort of answer those. I'm gonna check the chat, see if we have any questions. Um, I think, uh, so, sorry, Terrence, I actually, I missed your question twice. <laughs> uh, Terrence was, uh, I guess he didn't uh, hear the uh, question, your answer to the question, which is a great answer of the difference between propensity score and propensity score weighting. And so maybe if you could, if you could resummarize that. Oh yeah, um, yes, so propensity score. So the propensity score is the probability of getting the exposure or the probability of getting the treatment. So that's always gonna be fixed. That's just, that's the probability that you get out of that. Usually it's a logistic regression model, although you can use a different type of model to estimate. Any model that can estimate a probability can estimate a propensity score. And so that's, the, that's what the propensity score is. Propensity score weighting is basically a function of the propensity score, and it's one way to incorporate the propensity score into a final outcome model to be able to get a causal estimate. So hopefully that. Lisa, um, I'm gonna let you, we've talked about this several times, I'm gonna let you answer this one as Okay, well. so this it looks like Jaylee has a question about when we do propensity score matching, should we also be using the bootstrap? Yeah, Malcolm and I talk about this a lot. So, so Currently, I will say that in the literature, most people that do propensity score matching do not do a bootstrap. They basically, 
get their matched sample, and then once that matched sample has been achieved, they treat it as a fixed population and do their final analysis just like on that population and get the confidence intervals as you would in a normal setting. Now, I actually think there are circumstances where that will not get you quite the right confidence interval. And so best practice would be to wrap the whole process and you know try to bootstrap it. But it is more complicated because if you end up with like if you have a matching algorithm for example that's not going to always give you um, the same matched person like you can end up estimating effects in different populate slightly different populations and then you could end up with kind of a weird result so yeah. it, it's somewhat of an open question but the but the real answer i guess i'll say is that no people usually do not use bootstrap when they're and i think i feel like there's a paper by peter austin that tried to suggest that you really don't have to do like that the variance is okay when you do matching. Is that right? Am I remembering that correctly, Malcolm? That sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. 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 He's, by the way, that's actually a good suggestion for if you're interested in the more practical side. Uh, Peter Austin has written a lot of, a lot of articles about these causal inference techniques, just sort of like practical questions about using them day to day in your work. So that body of literature is really, really informative for this type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and it's not. It's also um, you know it's not as uh, obviously distorting your associations as weighting because weighting is upweighting people, right? They count more towards the analysis, and so it inherently distorts <clears throat> the associations between those people. And so um, it's just a, it's it's also just happening more clearly in the weights. Although with match, see, this is something that I sometimes talk because people with matching. I mean, you're it's almost more extreme though because you're downweighting people to zero that are not. Like, <laughs> yeah. that's what matching does. Yeah. Is basically, yeah, right, it right. takes anybody who doesn't get matched gets downweighted to zero. And some people, if you do an algorithm that is like a, a one-to-many match, then you end up upweighting some people to like five or six or whatever your many. Yeah. So I don't know. I I do think that there's. I don't think it's as simple as it sometimes made out to be, but. Yeah, that's where I lean as well. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, are there any other questions from the audience? Well, thank you all for joining us. I'm sorry we were a little bit, oh, I see. Um, this is really useful. Can't wait to try it. Oh, great. Oh, a long question. Okay, so I'll wait for, <laughs> we'll wait for this next question, but thank you all for, um, joining us. This was really enjoyable. Hopefully we'll be able to offer it again, maybe a little bit longer or with yeah. shorter examples or something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I and, think... uh, you know, please really, really think of yourselves as collaborators with us on that. You know, if you saw anything, you have suggestions on, um, you know, treat it like open source code. This is an open source teaching, you know, can help us, help us by contributing, uh, whether it's suggestions or, or whatever. Um, so that, you know, um, if there was anything that you found confusing or you found, found a typo or whatever, um, we'd love to know about it because, you know, it, it helps, um, it helps future students. And so, uh, help us help them, <laughs> uh, by doing that and, and collaborate with us on, on, uh, improving this, this course. Yep. Thank you so much. Somebody asked about a book. Um, I think Malcolm mentioned a couple books right at the beginning. Um, Miguel Hernan has a book that's really good. Uh, Malcolm and I are working on a book that hopefully will be good. <laughs> Maybe it's too soon to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, we're in the early stages of working on it. More about this question of use, doing causal inference in R, um, yeah. which is nice because that resource doesn't currently exist. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, so causal inference for me was a big one, but it's also, you know, um, it's, a, uh, it, it, it's not afraid to dive into the technical stuff. So if you, you may like that, you know, maybe you come from a statistics background and you want to see those formulas and that sort of thing. Um, uh, but I think as far as those books, it does get a, a relatively nice balance with that stuff. So even if you're not, you know, I'm not a biostatistician, so I wasn't diving so much into the technical formulas. Uh, and I, I, I find it very useful. I refer to it often. Uh, that's really my go-to. Yeah, I think, um, so there's a comment that Hernan might not be basic and that Pearl might have an intro book. And I actually find Pearl's writing a little bit hard. Um, I think it's very conceptual, but I find it hard from an analytic perspective sometimes to get to understand too. So I do think there's a gap in the literature for a very basic um, yeah. kind of explanation yeah. of some of this stuff. It's something actually, <clears throat> I think 
this week we'll have this podcast out, but Ellie and I talk about it on casual, casual inference that one thing that's tough in the causal inference framework is that up until now, most of the training has been really in this like um, mentor mentee kind of apprenticeship model where basically you learn it because your advisor is someone who is like as a PhD student, your advisor is someone who's steeped in it. And like, so my advisor's advisor was Rosenbaum and his advisor was Ruben. And my <laughs> framework was only that framework. And I only knew about causal people in that framework. And I learned all the basics because there wasn't even at the time a class in my department. It was just like I did an independent study with my professor and kind of learned these things through this like one-on-one -on -one apprenticeship. And I think that only very recently is it becoming where that's not the case anymore, but we haven't very yeah. efficiently written down the in-between parts. And so, um, yeah, so I think- that I, I, I am not from a situation like that. Like um, that, that was really not the case. Although to some degree that I have a little bit of a lineage going back to like uh, to Sandra Greenland, who's an epidemiologist, very interested in causal yeah. inference. Very, but yeah. in, in a lot of ways, I feel like I'm stealing sugar from the castle. Like I'm just- it's uh, good peasant who's <laughs> snuck no, on in and uh because it has been that way really and so but yeah. it's luckily it's opening up you know it's uh it's getting better and so it's great yeah so hope, we're hoping i do think that there's a lot of room for there to this kind of introductory stuff to get written down in a really clear way because there's a lot of high level um things but like what i'm noticing in the causal space is when people try to enter it from a different background so like in machine learning a lot of people are trying to get into causal work and they'll sometimes make some mistakes in their their mathematical assumptions and the causal people jump all over them but it's like there wasn't anywhere that like we all just sort of knew those assumptions because we we're sort of steeped in it but it's not actually written down anywhere and like so this is a real problem anyway okay there's a question are dags by themselves causal so this is the this is like a concept I think this is sort of a conceptual thing. A DAG is DAGs describe the assumptions. So they draw assumptions. They're basically a visual depiction of assumptions. And if those assumptions are true and you you estimate your effects based on what you've drawn in your DAG, the effect you estimate will be causal. So that so the DAG itself I wouldn't say is causal, but they are describing causal effects. I mean, the, the DAG, you're drawing relationships that you're assuming to be true and that you're assuming to be causal, but, but the DAG is, and, and these are not testable assumptions. And so basically the thing that the DAG is good for, I think, is that it gets you to write down those explicit assumptions and you can say this model I fit because I believe this is the underlying kind of relationship between all these variables. Does that answer that question, Malcolm? Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a great answer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. So, if we were in the wild, these techniques would you advise using the ATM as the default target estimate? I like the ATM a lot as a good target estimate, but it's not always the appropriate estimate of interest. And I think the kind of it does depend on your um, on your audience. But I think for the most part, I think the ATM is a very good target estimate. And the, what was the next question? Is there a way to derive how many bootstrap replications should be enough? Yes. So basically, you can bootstrap your bootstrap if you want to. You could do a double bootstrap and you can see the variation between your samples, like in your confidence intervals. And when your variation is small, sufficiently small, then you can say that you've had enough. Now in practice, usually what I do is I'll basically do like a leave one out situation where I'll essentially like run my model the number of times that I have samples in, and basically resample from my same data set that many times. But there are, you can, you can check like by doing this double bootstrap to make sure that you're not, your estimates aren't still wiggling. You know, one nice thing about the R samples package is it actually gives you a little bit of advice um, when you try and get the confidence intervals about whether or not you may or may not have enough some samples. Um, if you have too few, it will, it will actually warn you that, um, you know, we don't know for sure, but this, you may actually have too few uh, uh, bootstrap samples for this to, to get this confidence interval. Oh, that's nice. It warns you automatically. That's yeah, really nice. yeah, very nice. I bumped into that because guess what? I didn't do enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, somebody asked if our book has a URL. Unfortunately, it does not. This is supposed Very to be a early project, stages. but we'll, we can share it, I guess, <laughs> if we ever get one together. And then someone else asked if I could share how I calculated the weights column. And so I thought I would just show that code again real quick. So this is 
the code for the weights. So for example, the W-A-T-E weights, it's just, I'd use mutate to add the column. I'm calling it W-A-T-E, and then it, I use the formula, whatever formula you were using for whatever weight. So in this case, because I'm using an A-T-E weight, the formula is the indicator for whether or not you're in the treatment group divided by the propensity score plus one minus that indicator divided by one minus the propensity score. Yeah. And so when Which I run that, in practice, that ends up being the same, like, you know, I, I, in my earlier code, I had if else uh, as a wrapper, and that ends up being the same, right? Like, it's yes, dependent exactly. on... Yeah, I think you maybe did it, like, um, one over if else QSMK equals zero, then it's one minus fitted, and otherwise it's fitted, right? Right, right, right. right. Yeah. And as you said, mm -hmm. one of those parts drops out, and so... Um, exactly. So then if we, we can just prove to ourselves that these things are the same, <laughs> that, that these um, can come up all the times so that they're not equal. Never. Good. That's good news. Yeah. That's good news. <laughs> yeah. All right. It looks like the questions are kind of slowing down. So, yeah. um, I'll, I'm on Twitter at Lucy Stats. Here, I can send that in the chat in case people want it. Um, and that's a good way to reach me if you have further questions or if you're working through some of these examples and have more uh, that you're interested in. Malcolm, uh, what is the best way? Oh, there we go. Yep. And Malcolm is taking uh, a break from Twitter. Just, a, so. just until the end of summer. I've got a few busy things that are distracting. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have a uh, I don't have the brain space for Twitter right now, no, but that's um, totally yeah. And I, I will say, actually, you know, I think I think probably a lot of people in this particular group it's a probably a select group that um, is maybe a li little bit more involved in the Twitter R stats sphere uh, than other people. So you probably already know this, but just as Twitter is a great place to learn R, it's also a great place to talk directly with the experts on causal inference. Um, yeah. I've learned just like so, so, so much being on, on Twitter uh, and interacting with the causal inference community. Yeah, me too. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you to our ladies, LA, for organizing. This was great. I'm yeah, really grateful so that we could do this. Do our hosts have anything they want to address? Any meetups coming up or anything they want to announce? Uh, we don't have our August meetup scheduled yet, but look forward to something from us. And uh, we want to thank Andrew again for doing the uh, closed captioning. I hope that was helpful for thank anyone you. who's using it. And we are still recording, but I'm going to shut that off shortly. And I will um, let everyone know when the video is hosted by the uh, USAR 2020 team. So if you missed like the first 20 minutes or something, you can always watch again. Great. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. so much, everyone. Bye. Bye.